Good afternoon, everyone. By way of introduction, my name is Emma Montokyo. I am Head of Innovation and Impact Investments at DecuSatio. Just a little bit about me. My background is in finance management, strategy and innovation, which I majored in at Stellenbosch University. So firstly, we would just like to thank you for obviously investing your time to join us today. It's a challenging business environment and we really do appreciate that investment. So who are we at Decusatio? We are a South African advisory firm that typically supports entrepreneurial businesses who have a social impact element. We will often try and incorporate projects that have some form of BE elements, such as skills or enterprise and supplier development, but also align with the ESG of an organization or the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So our business is split into four parts, that being working capital solutions, human capital investment communications, and my part, which is that of impact investments. Uh, so some of the projects that we worked on include our Adopt an SME offering, which we ran with the likes of Microsoft, South 32, and the Sharks Rugby Business Center. The project that we're obviously going to be unpacking over the course of this webinar actually finds its roots when three guys got together to discuss sanitary pads. Uh, so that was being uh, for Blossom Care. It's a macro manufacturing model that was developed in various sites across the country, including South 32. With this, there was a recognition that renewable energy was going to be a big theme for 2023. So we are very excited to be involved in this project. So Ahmed will be taking you through the Solana story and I'll be looking at the Q&A section of this in the chat. Furthermore, if you have any inquiries or want to follow up with me about Solana, you can reach out to me at emma at decusatio.co.za and I'll drop that email in the chat. With this, I'm going to hand over to Ahmed, Business Development Lead at Solana Energy. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as Emma said in her intro, my name is Ahmed Mutara. I am um, responsible for business development um, at a solar energy business called Solana Energy. Um, my task today is to talk to you and to try and demystify or and simplify um, the concept of solar as a service. Um, you know, I'm sure um, as all of you probably are aware and would be considering on your own, um, you know, solar is highly topical at the moment, specifically with what's going on in South Africa. Um, you know, with the load shedding that we're experiencing, um, you know, our business has gone nuts in terms of inquiries. Um, so, you know, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Simon, thank you for the opportunity on the platform. Uh, and Emma, thank you for facilitating. Um, I've got a short presentation um, that I've prepared to take you through today um, for the next 10 to 15 minutes. I'm just going to ask um, um, M if you can confirm that this is coming up on the screen and everyone is able to see it. Yes, I can confirm that. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so solar as a service makes smart money sense. Um, before we delve into the topic um, specifically about solar as a service, I thought a very good place to start would be ex to explain a little bit about the work that we do. Who is Solana Energy? How have we come about? And what is our approach towards development within the um, solar energy space? Um, I've got a slide up here which effectively summarizes our platform and the way we manage our business. So we are Solana Energy. We sit in the middle of a platform that we've developed with a number of very important partners. Um, we've got accredited installers and a complete team of installers that we work with that look after the installations from a solar energy point of view. We've got our own solar training academy. That's an incredibly important component of our model. One of the things you'll see and that I will cover off in the um, slides that follow um, is some of the bottlenecks, issues, and potential risks that exist within market. And a lot of those relate to the kind of skills and whether we have accredited installers that are actually taking on solar installations. Within our platform, our customers and who we install for is incredibly important. Um, we work across the commercial and industrial markets as well as the residential market. 
The way we work with our customers, though, is slightly different um, to what you would typically find with solar businesses out in the market. I mean, you could go online and you could Google residential solar installations in Johannesburg, um, and you're probably going to pick up about 60 to 70 different companies that would come up who would be offering that service. Our model is slightly different in terms of how we work with customers and how we acquire with our customers. Um, we look specifically to work with corporates where what we look to do is offer solar solutions to their staff. It's a very important part of our model and it talks in um, a large way to the way funding and financing of solar systems is currently set up within South Africa. And I'll talk to that in a minute as well. We also work with a number of the largest suppliers of key component parts um, for solar installations. So these would be things typically like your batteries, your inverters and your panels. And that's a very, very important part of the business as well, specifically with some of the issues and challenges that are currently happening out in market. And finally, probably most importantly within our model is funding. Um, as you will hear in the slides to follow, solar as a service does require upfront funding. It requires someone who has got the funding that will allow you to purchase the panels, inverters, and batteries that you can install in your customers' homes or into businesses, um, and in return, enter into long-term revenue arrangements with your customers. Now, in order to do that, what you need is a business model that's incredibly secure, um, and you need funders who understand the renewable energy space, specifically um, solar. You know, you're talking about assets that you typically deploy within the space that have a lifespan anywhere of between 15 to 25 years, depending on the type of projects. Now, the model that we've set up is designed to achieve two very important outcomes. The one is a business model that is sustainable. And that is for obvious reasons, you know, nobody wants to go into business and not make money. But how do you set up a business model within the current environment where demand has literally gone through the roof? for solar systems? And how do you do it in a way where you've de-risked it in particular for your funders? So a lot of work's gone into how we um, source our funding, who we sell to, and all of the pieces in between in order to build a successful business. And the outcome that we are effectively concerned with is transformation. A bit about our history, we were funded through an ESD, Enterprise and Supplier Development Partnership, with South 32 Hillside Aluminium. They're one of the largest aluminium smelters in the Southern Hemisphere. And for those of you that are aware in South Africa, companies that do in excess of 50 million Rand in revenue are required to spend one and a half percent of the net profit after tax on transformation. And that would be developing new enterprises, developing new suppliers into the business, um, looking at socioeconomic development opportunities, looking at skills development, as well as BEE. So Solana is funded within that context. It's funded on those principles, which is why within our model, there are two things that work seamlessly together. There is a development component, and we're highly concerned with impact in terms of have we created jobs? Are we looking at the right types of skills that's feeding into the market? Are we creating new small Black-owned businesses? Are there new jobs within our ecosystem? And very importantly, within our model, 40% of the business is owned by our staff. So that's just a little bit about Solana Energy and the work that we do and the background um, that we come from. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening within the solar market at the moment. Um, I've put down this quote. It's something that I've heard more than once over the past couple of months, but literally people saying that this is the new gold rush. In South Africa at the moment, we are currently receiving on average about 2,800 applications daily for solar installations, for solar systems rather, to be installed within homes. Our installation capacity in South Africa is currently tracking at about 130 to 150 installations a day. And you can see the gap between delivery and demand. And what that's doing, and I'm sure some of you who may have considered applying for solar or wanting to install solar at home, are going to pick up increasingly longer lead times because of the demand that's building within the market. 95% of the demand that's coming in at the moment is coming in for a pre-funded solution. So effectively solar as a service. And I'll explain that within the next few minutes. So of the applications coming in every day, a large proportion of those are actually for pre-funded solutions. Not everybody 
has got somewhere between 150 to 250,000 Rand in cash that they can deploy into a solar system. So these kinds of innovations that are coming through out in market at the moment where different kinds of flexible payment options are offered is what's driving demand. What's also happening, and you know, this is, you know, I guess one of the, what do you call it, quirks, one of the frustrations of living in South Africa is the fact that solar is now being systematically targeted by criminal syndicates. Last week, one of our suppliers on batteries had two of their trucks hijacked with over 14 million rands worth of batteries um, basically hijacked. Um, the week prior to that, one of our suppliers out in Wadeville actually had armed guys enter their premises in a truck that held up the premises for something like 14 hours over a weekend and literally cleaned them out of all of the stock. And the impact that that's going to have in markets is that the cost of these components, whilst they should be coming down, globally they are tracking down. If you look at the costs of panels, if you look at the costs of inverters and batteries, they're starting to trend downwards. But if you have these kinds of issues that we have to deal with within South Africa, what it means is that suppliers and distributors are starting to add on security. There's higher levels of insurance and those costs ultimately get passed down onto consumers. So it is not a great thing. And we hopeful that somewhere along the line, there's going to be an added emphasis on SAPs or whoever the uh, criminal justice um, uh, networks and agencies are, where some sort of emphasis would be placed on starting to identify who's involved behind this, because it is now becoming a problem that is pervasive across the industry. As I'm sure some of you would have heard through the budget speeches last week about the personal income tax incentives, that's currently out for comment. We don't believe it's as strong as it could be. Uh, we also think there are some possibly material issues with the way the incentive is structured. But there's some time for public opinion and public feedback um, before that law is finalized. Um, and we're hopeful that once that law is finalized, the incentive to homeowners is going to be a lot stronger. The other thing about solar is the demand for jobs. We there are a number of reports out there at the moment, you know, in South Africa, crying out desperately for new jobs to, to this is possibly the ideal own space. We've created upwards of 27 jobs within a matter of months. At the end of our first year of operations out of KwaZulu Natal, will create in excess of uh, 130, 140 jobs just working within our platform. But solar is expected to generate in the region of about 40,000 jobs per annum starting within the next three years. Um, and very significantly, I think, as you are considering solar, is the opportunity over time where we are all going to be allowed to sell solar back into the grid. So what are the systems that are typically out there and that are available to homeowners at the moment? I've taken this directly off our solutions. So we are fairly standard with what you would find out in the market. We have got what we refer to as a load shedding solution. It is solar ready. It doesn't have the solar panels. It is literally the inverter and the battery, which provides you with enough backup power for a couple of hours or four hours at the max if you are being load shed. It obviously comes in at a lower price point. Um, on average, you know, these will go anywhere from about 49 to about 89,000 rand out to your market. Um, the higher costs are attributed to higher inverters, so five kilowatt inverters and five kilowatt batteries, but you have a solution that is literally just a load shedding solution. You then have three options that go out, which are full solar solutions, and these are typically five kilowatt systems eight kilowatt systems and 12 kilowatt systems. They've got different battery combinations. So you can add on batteries or you can take away batteries depending on what your needs are or your, or your requirements are. And if you are out in market at the moment looking to purchase any of these systems, what you can expect to pay is somewhere in these ranges. If you're looking to buy these systems for cash, this is currently what the market would be in terms of the cash price for systems. Our evergreen solution is what we refer to or is effectively our solar as a service solution. Um, and you know these scale based on the different types of um, systems that you would implement. We've also got a specific maintenance contract that we offer in particular to cash customers um, where we can provide ongoing maintenance to them. And there's a small once-off initiation fee. So this is kind of what your market average would be. 
So how does solar as a service work? What is it? And I think the easiest way to explain this would be if you used Wi-Fi. You know, all of us have got a contract with a uh, network service provider, whether it be AfriHost, MWeb, I'm with Rain on their 5G system. So typically what I would do for Wi-Fi is I would contact them. I would uh, find out what options they have available and I would sign up for a specific option. What they Rain would then do is send me a contract I would go through the contract, I would sign it, and I would end up paying a monthly fee, which would escalate within your CPI range annually. All of the routers, everything that I would need in order to enable me to set up my Wi-Fi at home would be funded and paid for by RAIN. So there's no obligation on me to carry any of those costs. And solar as a service works on exactly the same principle. First, you as the consumer don't own the system because it's been offered as a service. Your solar service provider would typically have these assets that would sit on their balance sheet. Solar as a service is brilliant because it comes with hassle-free operations and maintenance. So over the lifespan of your solar system, which would typically be a minimum of 15 years, if anything happens to your system, and, and, and let me just add as a point here that your panels, your inverters and batteries are designed to give you the lifespan of 10 to 15 years, 10 years on the batteries, but a minimum of 15 years on your inverters and panels. In that period, if anything happens that is a manufacturer issue, whether it be warranty related, guarantee um, issue, these are all managed seamlessly and hassle free if you have a solar as a service contract. And what you do is you pay a fixed monthly fee that escalates annually within the CPI range. And I think the maximum increase, if you look out in market at the moment, should be no more than 7%. If you compare that to ASCOM and the current tariff increases that are coming out in April, which is an 18% increase, and if you look at next year's increase, which is going to be a minimum of about 12 to 14 percent, cumulatively over the two years would be 30 percent more expensive for ASCOM power. Whereas with solar, what you would be doing is paying an escalation of 7 percent annually. So over the lifespan of the asset, solar saves you a significant amount of money. So when should you consider solar as a service? I mean, I, through our business, I'm a customer for solar as a service. Um, and the reason I've opted for that specifically is one, not to overcapitalize, um, you know, to lay out 259,000 Rand on an eight kilowatt system that I've got at my home is not something that I wanted to do. But because I'm currently paying ASCOM for electricity, I would much rather pay for solar as a service, which gives me the protection from load shedding, but also over time and very soon, once the solar system is implemented, you'll begin to see significant drops in what you will be paying ASCOM. So net net, what you will be paying per month on a solar as a service contract versus what you would be paying to your current municipal or ASCOM um, service provider is going to be lower and lower quickly. Um, it takes about one or two months until your ASCOM ball kind of settles. But as you move into month three is when you really start to see significant savings. And we're finding that for a lot of people, you know, the cash cost of these solar systems is prohibitive. It's one of the reasons why there's such significant growth, um, you know, that's coming through on solar as a service or rent to own options. It also makes sense if you're the owner of a property and you do not want to overcapitalize, you know, in South Africa, in Johannesburg at the moment in particular, I think, in South Africa at large, is if you look at what's happening with the residential property market, prices on residential properties in Johannesburg are beginning to drop. Um, it's due to semigration, due to emigration, but there's a number of challenges. So if you're looking to sell, the last thing you'd want to do is to overcapitalize because you know you're not going to recover the cost. So solar as a service makes perfect sense to a lot of homeowners. And if you're renting, right, one of the things that we would say, and we're picking this up quite a bit through our market and the demand that's coming in, there's a number of inquiries that are coming in directly from landlords who now realize that in order for them to maintain the rental and the tenant within their rental property, it's important that they do have an alternative energy solution. For these landlords, it doesn't make sense to overcapitalize, hence solar as a service um, makes a lot of sense. And I think also with solar as a service, what you get is peace of mind. Now, there are things to be aware of, and this is something that I would caution everyone listening on to to pay particular attention to. Because of what's happening out in market, there are a number of installers out there. You've got carpenters, plumbers, tilers, guys that were in the building trade, 
that are now beginning to move into the solar installation um, side to it because that's where the demand is. Make sure that whoever you are going to be working with are accredited installers. Now, what does that mean? There's three things or two really important things that I would say to look out for. The one is that the team that's installing your solar system are accredited through SAPVIA. That's the South African Photovoltaic Industry Association. They currently issue a green card, which effectively confirms that the team that's working on site has been accredited to work within solar. DC, which is effectively the current that you generate from solar, is very different to AC. So even if you are a trained and qualified electrician, you still need to be accredited and trained within the DC component um, in order to make sure that you have the right accreditation. That is incredibly important because as you get into insurance, as you get into guarantees, as you get into warranties, these are the things that may not matter now because the industry is at its infancy and beginning to develop it is going to matter in future that is going to do a professional assessment that is incredibly important um, you know you can apply online and people will tell you just purely based on your electricity bill that you need an eight kilowatt system don't settle for that look for suppliers who are going to come in sit down at home with you and understand when you have no ESCOM power, and if you want to run your home through your battery system, what do you want powered up in your home during that period? Those kinds of things are incredibly important because you can save a lot of money in your system choice if you're smart in terms of how you're looking to install solar. Very important as well is to make sure that you are using only tier one components. Tier one effectively means that you have got suppliers and distributors in South Africa that have got offices on the ground that will maintain and look after the warranties and guarantees that are incredibly important. And finally, I think the contracting framework. Solar is a service from a funding point of view. Typically the way businesses work within the space is they pay back the asset over 10 years. Now, it's unrealistic to assume, you know, like especially from a consumer point of view, um, you know, that you're going to sign up for a 10-year contract. So what a lot of uh, suppliers do is they start with a three-year contract subject to an automatic renewal. So check the term that you are signing up for. You don't want to be signing up for something that's too long, but you also want to recognize that these systems do get paid back over 10 years. So the reasons why they'll start with three with the automatic options to renew is because when we look at paying back our investment on our solar as a service option, we pay back to our funders over 10 years. Um, the other thing that's important from a contracting framework that I would add is if you are renting a home, make sure that the contract is with the landlord and not with you. This is something that's common practice. No landlord is going to turn away the option of having solar installed in order to maintain um, you know, sort of their tenancy within their within their property. So if you're renting, it's important to make sure that the landlord's involved. If you are a homeowner, very important, when you do sell your home, one of the things to check out for in the contract is if there's any specific mention or reference to what you will be required to do in the event of the sale of your property. And typically how most suppliers work is you either add on the outstanding cost of the solar system onto the sale price of the house, or in your house sale agreement, you have a clause where the new owner will take over um, solar as a service contract. So, you know, it's a, it's a space that's evolving. There's a lot of um, stuff happening within this and be on the lookout to make sure that you understand the contract that you're going to be signing for. And this is a final slide I've put up just, you know, I mean, there are significant benefits on going solar. Um, obviously the relief from load shedding, um, you know, the environmental considerations are significant. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work looking at, um, you know, the environmental side to renewable energy and why, if as a country, as a community, as, you know, sort of people living on Earth, if we don't start making significant moves to a carbon-free future, that we may not have a future. And that's not an over-exaggeration. I would draw your attention to the floods we're experiencing, to the devastation with droughts around the world, wildfires, extreme weather conditions. This is a real consideration. 
You are going to save money. Definitely, there are loads of different models that you can go out and check online where guys have done really detailed analyses in terms of solar and what it's going to save you over time. Where your savings are exponential is because of the difference between the projected ESCOM tariff price increases over time and what your price increases will be on solar. A very significant opportunity that's coming into residential is going to be feedback into the grid. We are going to be able to sell power back into the grid. You know, typically within a home, 60% of your energy consumption would come after 6 p.m. in the evening. Um, you're using considerably less power during the day. So during the daytime, there's an opportunity if you are with a supplier where they can aggregate on behalf of all of their customers, you'll be able to sell back into the grid. And that's going to be a significant revenue opportunity that will actually in future drive the cost of your solar system to a cost neutral, or to a cash positive position. And finally, the tax incentives. You know, for businesses, there are a number of really attractive incentives for businesses to roll into the space. Uh, but for homeowners, they've just announced the one. Um, we think that is going to change as the legislation gets formalized and promulgated over the course of the year, but it's something to definitely keep an eye out for. Um, so um, I think I'm going to stop there and hand back to you to see if there are any questions. All right, thanks sure, very thanks. much. Hey, Madness, bunches of questions coming in. Ahmed, you've taken a bunch of them already uh, just around this. One from Leo, and he's asking if if he's selling back. The city of Cape Town is talking around letting uh, users sell back into the grid. Would that accrue to the individual or would it accrue to the company providing the service? So I think if you look at what's happening at the moment within the Cape Town space, you've got uh, a company called Go Solar, which is one of the largest residential guys out in market. Um, Go Solar currently um, are looking at sharing um, the opportunity with residential owners. So if you look at solar service as a service and how we would evolve, eventually evolve, we think there's going to be a shared revenue model. Um, perfect. A uh, bunch of them. Uh, oh, the other one is, I mean, is it, and, and a couple of folks have asked this in various different ways. Can I pull solar off my roof and, and sort of give some to my neighbor? I mean, I'm kind of selling, but I'm not selling into the grid. Or was that sort of a bit of a gray area? It would be at the moment, um, um, Simon, in particular, because um, you know, when we when you look at doing things like selling back into the grid, these are registered against specific meter numbers that are located at your home. Let me just add that there's nothing in the legislation that would stop anybody from wanting to do that at the moment. You, you might very well, you know, get away with it, set up a solar system bigger than what you need and maybe sell to your neighbor on either side. But as the market gets a little bit more regulated, specifically with the feed in tariffs, that's not something that will be allowed. A uh, question coming through from Mark around the evergreen option on your website, as I understand that is the seller as a service as opposed to the, the cash payment. Yes, that's correct. Uh, a couple of folks were asking, who are the people? South African Photovoltaic Industry Association uh, are the official folks there. Are there minimum uh, contract durations? Does the, you, you said typically it'll be three years and then auto renew. I mean, is is, is, the, is that sort of the, the, the minimum? And at the end of it, I could, if I wanted, uh, uh, exit the process. Yeah, so look, I mean, I think the minimum that they tie you will tie you down for is a period of three years without any penalties. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the logic that a lot of the suppliers are applying out in market at the moment is no one is not going to want a reliable, renewable source of energy, you know, so that whether it moves from one person to the other is that over time you will recover the cost. Um, so, you know, I think there's a bit of, um, you know, sort of consideration there, I think, in particular with, you know, the consumers to look at not tying them into lengthy periods, which is why the three year period kind of is your minimum period with no penalties. If you mm -hmm. choose to terminate within that period, there are penalties that will apply. And I'm assuming that within that period, and it kind of ties into, let's do Bernard's question first, what sort of costs are not covered? I mean, for example, insuring the, the hardware sitting on yeah. your roof and, and in your basement. So the way solar as a service is structured in South Africa is that the homeowner would be responsible for bearing the cost of insuring the plant. Now, 
there's your guarantees and warranties that you have. And what those typically would do is protect you from any manufacturer malfunction or issue with the product. Mm. If you've had a hectic hailstorm, for example, and you'll find one or two of the panels, um, you know, would be uh, damaged. Whilst those would be sorted out through your solar as a service provider, what you would need to do is claim that back through your normal household insurance. Solar as a service providers won't insure the product at your home because if you talk to a lot of guys within the insurance space, they're not comfortable that you are insuring an asset over which you have no control that's located at a remote uh, property that you, you don't have any control over. So that's typically how the market is set currently. The insurance cost would be for the homeowner. Uh, but just you know, to give you some some idea of what your costs would be there, um, you know, we've in on if you've got household insurance, so you've got insurance on your home, uh, typically you're looking at an extra forty nine rand a month really to bring in okay. solar panel. It's not that much. Okay, then not onerous at all. A, a lot of questions yeah. coming through in terms of I've got X, I'm using Y. Uh, what do I need? You've got your your different options, but you also made a great point, which is actually to to really chat to the folks who are going to be installing, yeah. um, because it is going to be unique for 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 different people for example i work from home which is different from someone who's out of their house every day from eight until six yeah and we're finding that a mistake that a lot of people are making is they're going for a bigger system than what they need so a lot of people are kind of veering towards the eight kilowatt system because it seems like oh you know that's what i'm going to need when really what you need is a five kilowatt system and you guys it, it, it is amazing how efficient this technology is um, you know the power that you generate um, you know through your panels um, you know the way the inverters work and the battery and I think if you smart in particular about what you tie into your backup system so this is what you want to power when there is no ASCOM power when you need that backup if you're really smart and you look at things like your lights you have the wi-fi um, you know typically that's all most people need um, you know, and you take off things like, you know, maybe one of the geezers, you take off the oven. If you have that kind of discussion with your solar service provider, you're going to end up with a much better solution than just picking one off the website and saying, that's the one for me. Yeah, I mean, I've looked and I mean, truthfully, I have no idea. A question from Peter, which is a great question. Are you able to 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 upgrade from from one package to the next? I mean, if if you, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe suddenly you, I don't know, you, you, your needs massively increase. You, you should be fairly simple to to upgrade it to another package. Yeah, and it's quite easy to do within the solar as a service framework. All you're literally doing is swapping from one option to the other. So think about it with your cell phone provider. They've got different contract options. And when your contract mm -hmm. comes up for renewal or during your contract term, you can upgrade. You have the same flexibility within solar as a service. What's great about the solar platforms with the panels inverters is typically what most people do is add on battery capacity where they need more and more storage in order you know, to service them at home. But you can also move up in terms of inverter size, add on panels, all of those things are possible. Great question coming through, this one particularly around sectional title, but I, th I mean, I live in, a, in, in apartments and, and the challenge we have is we can't have everyone put solar on the roof. Yeah. Is, it, is it practically possible, and even as solar as a service, to panel the roof and then have it going to individual batteries and inverters in the various different apartments? No, no. I mean, we've done a lot of work in the sectional title space. Typically on that route, you have to work with the body corporate. You need the entire building to move onto solar rather than to do it on individual homes. If you're on the third floor of a six-story apartment block, it's very difficult to have a couple of panels. And then because of the way these buildings are configured in terms of the main electricity supply, it becomes incredibly complex and actually very costly. Um, so typically what we do within our sectional title clients is we engage directly through the body corporate, do a presentation through the body corporate and then roll out a solution. I mean, a good example of that is we're currently busy on a project out in Mpumalanga and Mbombela, where there's an 87 uh, home residential estate and we're taking the entire estate onto solar and that's being done through the body corporate. Gotcha. Uh, I'm not sure easy this, but based on, on, on configurations, I mean, what is typical recharge time under sunny and under cloudy? And I, I was actually at a friend who's got solar as a service, and I was quite astounded to see it wasn't just cloudy, it was raining, and he was actually still drawing from the, the sun. It wasn't a lot, yeah. but it absolutely was. What is a typical recharge? Um, so I think, um, you know, and I'll use myself as an example, right? So our average electricity bill, um, is upwards of 3,000 Rand. We decided to go for the eight kilowatt system. 
on the eight kilowatt system, even during four hours of load shedding, where there's a continuous draw on the battery in order to power the home, um, our battery never runs down below 80% or, you know, sort of that's kind of the most it's ever gone to, even with an extended period of, um, you know, power outages. And the recharge is really quick. I mean, typically within an hour, hour and a half, the batteries are back up to, um, you know, the 9900% level. Yeah, that's the experience. But I know, folks, you've literally never seen the the the, the battery drop below eighty. Can uh, the the solar panels go on an asbestos roof? Are there are there restrictions as to the type of roof? I imagine it can't do thatch. But aside from that, uh, it can actually do thatch. Oh, okay. um, there are solutions. <laughs> yeah, there are application solutions at the moment to apply panels onto thatch that are coming out. Um, it requires a bit of a mounting structure to be actually placed on, but mm -hmm. it can be done. Um, in terms of the different types of roof structures for homes, typically tiled, corrugated, asbestos, all of these do work, um, you know, which is why I think it's really important to have the assessment with the guys on site, because that's one of the things that they will check out. They'll check the orientation from a position point of view are you northeast facing they look at optimum placement of the panels they'll get into the ceiling and have a look and see if there's any integrity issues but really you know with, with the way these mounting structures are designed now um simon they're incredibly efficient lightweight they're all aluminium and the panels literally just clip onto them uh so they're very very you know they've, they've got a lot of flexibility in terms of the different types of roof structures that they're able to go onto Mike has spotted a hack. He says after three years, wouldn't it make sense to terminate the contract and rent a brand new system? I mean, unless there's huge increases in efficiencies, I'm not sure your massive benefit. No, I, yeah, look, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you could potentially, you know, if that's the route that you'd wanted to go. But the benefits with solar as a service is that your system's maintained through the duration of the contract at the best in market standard. You don't need to replace your panels every three years. You'll be wasting a lot. You don't need to replace your inverter. So if there is a challenge and if there is an issue, it's your supplier, your service provider will come in and automatically address those. So look, it's not, you know, I mean, I don't think it's perfect. I think there are loopholes and challenges, you know, with the rate at which this market's developing. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, common sense will prevail as well, you know, in terms of how these, you know, systems are managed. Um, you know, and if somebody wants to terminate after three years, what's going to happen is your system is going to be deinstalled and they'll place it somewhere else because those are still, you know, have got a number of years left in them in terms of the lifespan. On that last time point, I mean, let's say I sign up and, and I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years later, my system is now old, the battery has done its its lifespan, et cetera. Part of the solar as a service would be a replacement of those, I would imagine, essentially. Automatically automatically that would happen yeah um a question from mark he's saying surely if you're only using around 80 percent of battery your system is is over designed and that was the question i had for, for for one of my friends and he said yeah but this is daytime when you've got the sun in the evening yeah. probably more draw yeah the, the evening would be a little bit more draw though you know if i have a look at the current load shedding cycles we tend to have on our side the four hour load shedding hit typically between midnight and 4 a.m., you know, which is when everybody's sleeping and there isn't anything happening regardless. So you're literally using about 150 watts in order to power up whatever you've got running in the home. Um, so, yeah, look, I mean, we the, the reason, you know, we've gone with that is we've got one of the geysers connected and we actually have a gas hub, but an electric oven. And we've actually kept the oven connected as well, you know, just for emergencies, you know, so if we do need to use it. We can draw that off the battery. And I think it's a good point because, you know, that's going to come out in the assessment. Your The size of your system is going to be specced based on the assessment that somebody will do. And that's what's going to determine what you need. Yeah. And, and I take that. And, and, and I'm interested if you can put the, the, the oven on because everyone seems to take it on. I'm like, what if I'm halfway through doing my Sunday roast? Uh, uh, you know, I'm prepared to to sacrifice yeah. some, some battery there. What is battery degradation? I, I, I mean, we've moved on. We've moved way away from the, the lead acid. And as I understand, these batteries really are, are robust. And, and I mean, getting a decade out of them shouldn't be a challenge. Not at all. Um, not with the lithium ion um, technology that's out now and the kind of batteries that are coming out. There's a number of new battery technologies that are also emerging. You know, there's sodium ion batteries, um, mm -hmm. you know, where it's actually seawater is used in the process. Um, and there's a number of other types of technologies at the moment that are beginning to emerge because what people recognize within the renewable energy space is your challenge is not necessarily the generation of power, it's the storage. 
And it's an area that's lagged, you know, a little bit in terms of, you know, kind of the development and from a cost point of view. But watch this space. There's going to be a lot of new technology that's going to be emerging on batteries. I'm excited because batteries have been boring for a long time. Mm -hmm. Another question from Anonymous. Uh, option to convert from Evergreen to perhaps an outright purchase uh, during the term of contract, maybe after the first three years? Those are available as well. So I think, you know, that's a good question. I would ask for that. Um, I think on one of the uh, questions that came through on Twitter or that we were, were, were uh, that you shared, um, Simon, um, there was a question as well around, um, you know, whether, let me just pull it up here. Uh, so I see if I, I rent to uh, own. The rent to own. Yes. So, you know, if you look at our solutions at the moment, you've got the cash option and you've got the evergreen option. They are rent to own options. So we've had clients who've chosen to come in and pay like a 50,000 rand deposit and then pay the balance off over a period of time, like two years, you know, because that suits them a lot better. The value, obviously, or the benefits of the rent to own and the cash systems is you own the system. Mm -hmm. Right. So as the, you know, sort of the owner of the system, whereas, you know, the key difference with the solar as a service is you don't own the system. Um, but those options are available. And I would encourage everyone, if you're looking at it, inquire about what those financing options are so that you can make the best choice for yourself. Yeah. Um, and of course, the challenge is when you own it and now suddenly it, it's it's all of your hassles uh, in, in, yeah. in terms of of, of maintenance yep. and, and all of that. Uh, not seeing any more questions coming through. The ones on Twitter, as you touched on selling your house, the math, supplying neighbors, uh, funding, uh, the solar rebate from the budget. Uh, I, I agree with you on that. I thought it was great for business, not great for individuals. No. Hopefully we'll see something better coming through for that panel's end of life. Ladies and gents, we are done. Uh, Emma, I'll hand uh, back to you for uh, a quick wrap. And if you've picked up anything uh, that you've seen for, for uh, Ahmed. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ahmed, for the presentation. I'm not seeing anything on my side. I think you've covered all the basics. So thank you, everyone, for joining the call. Um, otherwise, I'm going to end it there. We'll leave it there, Great. ladies and gents. The video will be up uh, uh, later this evening on the YouTube uh, and the JustOneLap.com website. Appreciate everyone's time. Cheers, all. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.